start. What we're talking about is uh, we're having a discussion. In a discussion, you have like two sides of things, right? And I know something else. I've been in a place where I've seen sincerity. And you know we can be sincerely right. And we can be sincere and be wrong, am I right? You ever had that? Did you thought something? So we have to be careful that we have a standard, which we have, which is God's Word, and see what it says about things. Tonight is going to be interesting because I'm going to a section of the, the Bible which is not in my Bible. It's the American Standard Bible that doesn't have this, but in my other Bible, my new American Bible, that is in there. And one Bible is what we call a Catholic Bible. One Bible is what we call a Protestant Bible. Maybe we're wrong in calling it that. But before we start, I want to show you some of the things I saw recently. And uh, we're looking about, we're going to see some idols. And we see the idols that people really, really believe in. And people really dedicate them to. This is the Sui Dalagon Pagoda in the center of Yangon, which is in Burma, or Myanmar. Buddhists throughout the world come to this place. Because this thing is like 200 and some gold every year. Can you imagine? That is real gold. They have another pagoda just like this one here. And as you look up there, you can see they have things made so nobody can climb up because they also have gold and jewels there. And in this religion, they believe that by doing things, you can earn merit. Now, if you're going to play with religion, you ought to be logical. If you have a religion that has no God, which ours has no God, who gives you merit? So we could talk about that a long time. But I just wanted to show you some, some idols. Now, which idol is the best idol? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, choose you the Buddha that you must you would serve. When I went to this place the first time, I was amazed. Look at the number of Buddhas there are there, just in this one enclosure. Now, do people believe these are beneficial to them? Look at the ladies down here. See? Now, we, we know the word proskuneo means to put yourself down or bow yourself down to. And that's why you and I have to be careful what we do in religion. Because sometimes I'm tempted to, you know, do things maybe. Are you? If you come from a background like I do, the most normal thing is it right for us? Even though someone says, what are you doing? I don't know. It's just on my automatic. You know, I'm going to eat, okay? I'm on the airplane, okay? And I'm not making fun. I'm saying that's how we, am I right? We're trapped. Somebody told us that, and even when we said it's not necessary, we find ourselves almost doing it. Now, I told you last night, good evening, that not only do they have good spirits, good gods, but these are the nits. These are the bad gods. And they have displayed here, so you can talk to a bad god if you want to also. And they made them to look like the Englishmen. See, these are white guys. That come back for the Burmese time with the in, with the English there. But look at this. And at the bottom of each one of these is a Buddha. And these people, remember last night we were talking about don't get into astrology, don't get into the zodiac. You don't know anything, and I don't know anything about the zodiac. They got signs for every day, and your birthday has a special day. You can go to their the place that's got your date here. And you can pour water on Buddha and have some kind of ceremony in this big place. Now, is this a holy place? No. Not to you, but let me tell you, if you're a foreigner, there's two things going to happen to you there. One, you have to pay to get in, and two, you still must take off both your shoes and your stockings. So these people really believe there's something sacred about this. But if you can get the book and read everything, good evening, then come in, come in. I think your place is still reserved. Um, anyway, they're very, very sincere about these things that they're doing. I, I was amazed, you know. I mean, I would rather you pick the Buddha that's like the face you like, I guess. Because, you know, look, this one looks a little bit like a balasan, a dalaga. Doesn't it? The dress, the way they dress. Very effeminate looking. This one, not so much so. But look at the length of the ears, y'all. Looks like something come from another country. The people from all parts of the world come here that are Buddhist. And look, these are ladies who are nuns. How do they make their living? In my hotel, I noticed in the morning very early, 
Three of them came, came quickly up to the door. They were handed some food, quickly off. People feed them, and when they feed them, they think they get merit by doing so. But do you think that is a religion of idolatry? How could you deny it? I mean, by look at the size of that Buddha. And then look at this Buddha. You got all the brightness behind it. This one's very big, and that impresses you. Look, it does impress people. And you can almost feel in people's hearts when you see people that are so sincere and they think something, and they're it's kind of like let's make a deal, isn't it? Isn't that what we do? Let's make a deal. God, I got a big problem. This Buddha, I got a big problem. Or this, they wouldn't say Buddha there. Buddha here. Uh, give me this, and I'll give you this. If you do this, I'll, is that all right? I had a friend. He said, God, if you cure my mama, I'll serve you. But his mama died, and he said, I'm an atheist. You know what we're really saying? A thing like that. God can be my God if God does what I want Him to do. Huh? You can be my God, and I'll, let, I'll be zealous if you do what I want to. And what bothers you? I don't know about you, but I go sit in religious places. I go sit in cathedrals just to feel what people are feeling and see what people are feeling. And I see this sometimes. You see someone going down the, the aisle on their knees, huh? And praying all the way, and you know inside their heart they're saying, ah, you, need, you see me? I'm doing something here. I'm sincere. Now, are you going to do what I want? Will you do what I want? And the terrible thing is what? We serve a God who knows best, and we do what He wants. It's by if you do it the other way. I have a picture of the monk here. They're all over the place. As I looked at this big place, I wondered something. You know, when you have big buildings and you have big schools, you have things like that. There's competition, isn't there? And I wonder, I wonder who's in charge. I wonder what man's in charge of all this. I wonder how he got there. And I wonder if there was any hard feelings as he got there. It's an interesting thing to think about. Anyway, we've now seen some idols for real. And we don't make fun of the people because they're sincere. But if you sit down with logic, it doesn't fit with logic. When we started our preaching over there, our teaching over there, we had to say, the world is not always going to be here. Time is not a circle. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. No one could take his place. And down there someplace in history, there is an end coming. And we are here in a time of probation, getting ready, and I said, I said to you last night, and we realized in the number of things that we have experienced in our own country, other people have experienced in their countries, how long does it take for our world to change? That quick, right? 35 seconds. Now I'm going to, to a very interesting, one of the most interesting passages I've ever found about idolatry, and I was reading my Catholic Bible, and I was reading the Apocrypha, and I came across the wisdom of Solomon. Now, wow, I found out Solomon had much to say about idolatry. <coughs> Does that surprise any of you? If this is really written by Solomon. <coughs> Suppose, tell me the book that Solomon wrote. But you know Solomon wrote the Bible. Now, not in the, not in the, the Apocrypha books. He wrote what? He collected the Proverbs, right? Ecclesiastes, what else? Psalms. Psalms. Psalms, some of the Psalms. What else? What's another one? Um, song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. What's the Song of Solomon about? Love between a husband and wife, the way it ought to be. Huh? The way it ought to be. Who wrote the book? How many wives did he have? <laughs> How many concubines? Isn't that ridiculous? A man has 700 wives and 300 concubines and he writes a book on marriage love? Huh? Now, why is that? This is what surprises me. If Solomon really wrote what we were studying tonight, when he ended his life, God decided to rip the kingdom in half and give ten tribes to Jeroboam the son of Nebat because King Solomon had married all those women 
and had begun to worship their gods and their idols when he himself had been approached by God twice in his lifetime. He was so wise that he knew you cannot put God in a box. And when he told God, God, I know we're building this thing, but I know you don't dwell here. And so when you're there and you hear us pray in heaven, then do what we want. And yet, he became an idolater. Remember that as we study what he had to say. And he said, For all men were by nature foolish who were, were in ignorance of God, and who from the good things seen did not succeed in knowing him who is, and from studying the works did not discern the artisan. But, I, but by either fire or wind or the swift air or the circuit of the stars or the mighty water or the luminaries of heaven, the governors of the world, they considered gods. Was that true? Sure they did, don't they? What's the name of, what's the, who's the moon goddess? You studied your, so you can't study religion in school, but you can study Roman Greek mythology. Diana huh, is the moon goddess. Who's the god of the sun? Apollo. Oh. God of love. Jesus. Aphrodite. Aphrodite is the goddess of? Love. Which they love. But that's, that she is extremely important because she's like Astarte in the Bible. She is the goddess who controls fertility. And you will be serious if you are a rancher or if you're a farmer about fertility. Correct? All right. And it's actually, so he said, are you filled with wonder? Are you filled with wonder at the things God has created? I have fellow citizens in America that have no time for God, but they just love nature. In fact, some of the men like Thoreau and Emerson and some of those, the transcendentalists, they kind of worship nature like the people the Hindu religion do. And he says here they see all these things, but they did discover God, but they started making the stars and the moons and all those things gods. Now, if out of joy in their beauty, these things, they thought them gods, let them know how far, ex how far more excellent is the Lord than these, for the original source of beauty fashioned them. You know, any of you art majors? Anybody an art major here? Anybody like to paint? Yeah, this girl does. And when she gets done with one picture, will she be done? No. Why not? Why didn't you capture beauty? <clears throat> oh, oh, what are you really trying to picture when you paint? Beauty. Beauty. <clears throat> but where does beauty come from? So what are you trying to picture? You're trying to show something of God, correct? If you're a scientist uh, and you're studying mathematics, are you filled with wonder at your mathematics? I am. I don't like math. But I want a man who knows math when we build a bridge. Because God has made things in such a way that we can see there's a grand and glorious order in our universe. And people in our world who deny the existence of God should be the very ones who pray at their desk or pray in their laboratory because they are only following the steps that God has left for them. And we are learning things that God has done, and our hearts are filled with wonders. Your television shows it, right? You see the little birds that shouldn't be able to fly across the Gulf of Mexico, that fly across the Gulf of Mexico? How did they do that? And we are so foolish to say, they decided one time. No, they didn't. You don't decide to have wings, do you? Do you? made the way we are made but the terrible horrible thing about it is that we don't recognize the God just like they did not and they become so foolish by trying to fashion the God or if they were struck by the might and energy let them from these things realize how much more powerful is he who made them who is star she is a new hero who's star you know you're not much into you're not much into Lightning. You're not much into two yeah, religions, are you? Uh, the guy with the lightning bolts. He is the god of the Norwegians and god of those people who had, see, but that's what he's talking about, power. They say that Martin Luther got better religious. You know why? Because lightning nearly hit him. Lightning, and he got better religious. Well, you can get very religious if lightning nearly hits you, right? <laughs> Correct? 
and you see the things of God. For from the greatness and the beauty created of created things, their original author by analogy is seen. Is there a God? Paul says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. His eternal power also and divinity so that they are inexcusable. No one who turns away from God and lives for themselves and makes their own heart and their own greed their idol is right with God. No one that goes and does like those, those sincere people in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in Laos, in, in Burma who built these big religious things to Buddha. Huh? That sincere, they're not right. But you know one thing. There's two things you know by nature. Number one, there is a God. Number two, he is all powerful. True, true? True. Amen. If we just take time, get someplace where the lights aren't around us, and be able to look at the sky, you become very tiny, very small. When the stars are there, I used to have to walk in the Navy, a uh, uh, walk four hours at night, guarding nothing. They make you do that. You're guarding an open field. But one thing about it is, I can see the sky. And the longer I walked, the smaller I got. Because the sky got bigger and bigger, and I know it. No one I've ever met on the earth had anything to do with making that world. And so do you. There is a God, and by the universe and the grandeur of all this, He is all part. Further, because it's so complex, He's all one. But yet, for these the blame is less. For they indeed they go astray, perhaps, though they seek God and wish to find Him. At least they were looking for God, he's saying. For they search busily among His works, but are distracted by what they see, because the things seen are fair. Things are so pretty, you start worshiping the things, right? Some people love their puppy more than they love their God. Am I right? They know more about their puppy than they know about their God. All right. Huh? Not the cops. Okay. Oh, oh wait, in the Philippines, <laughs> the Philippines were, were into the birds. We're with the birds, that's right. We're, we take care of our rooster more than we take care of our son. We'll teach our rooster to pray more than we'll teach our son to pray. Am I right? We'll teach him about Saint Miguel. Don't you. <laughs> But again, not even these are partable. So he said, even though they were looking for God and they didn't find Him, you give them commendation for looking for God, but you cannot pardon them. Why? Because, for if they are so far succeeded in knowledge that they could speculate about the world, how did they not more quickly find its Lord? Huh? As we go deeper and deeper into the oceans, what are we discovering? There's nothing there. It's all blank. It's all dead. Right? Wrong. Wrong. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Places where there's no sunlight, there is still life. Yes. And we feel, oh, how did they do that? They didn't do yeah. that. Mm -hmm. oh. If you think you can evolve into something, I just want you to start walking underwater for fun with nothing on. You put it drown. We've got to be made by God to be there. But He made it, and it's every place shows He's there. Look, brother, what the psalmist says in 19.2, The heavens show forth the glory of God, and the firmament declares the works of His hands. Day to day utters speech, and night to night shows knowledge. There are no speeches nor language where their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone forth into all the earth, and their words into the ends of the world. Brother, Paul uses this to argue. They said, well, have they not all heard? He said, yes, they've all heard. The sound has gone out into the world. When Brother Paul preached in Athens, what did he say? He preached, no, excuse me, when he preached in Ephesus, in Acts 20, he said, I came to you and I preached repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why did he talk that way? Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The Jewish people and the Gentile people in Ephesus did not know about Jesus, correct? But could they know about God? This psalm says there's not a human being who can deny the existence of God. We all know there's a God. Not only do we know there's a God, 
but we are made with a moral compass inside of us because we're made in the image of God. That's why you and I can sit down with the Japanese and say, what's your religion? Well, I'm not sure I got one. Maybe it's business. Maybe it's Zen Buddhism. And you say, well, the deal you just made with me is not fair. And what does he say to you? It is too fair. <coughs> and we don't ever stop to say what the word fair is because we both know when somebody's cheating. We both know that when there's morality and when there's immorality. And that's made, we're made in the image of God. And we know right and wrong. And so Brother Paul said, I want to tell you that you ought to be sorry for the things you've done that's wrong. You ought to make a decision not to do them anymore. And that sadness should cause you to repent. And then I also told you about the way to escape from your sins by telling you about Jesus Christ. You see the logic of all this? But, now we go back to Psalm. But doomed are they, and in dead things are their hope, who term God's things made by human hands. Gold and silver, the product of art and the likeness of beasts, are used to stone, the work of an ancient man. Let me ask you something. If you are a person that really believes that maybe, you know, idols are okay, if they're made of religious things, how would you like your idols to be made in China? <laughs> what do you have here? They can manufacture them cheaper, right? Just make sure they don't use any lead paint. Um, what would you feel like? You, you, you go into a religious store and you lift up the eye and you look at the bottom and it says, Made in China. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. No, you say, no, China? Yes. This thing is so good, they don't even believe it. Right? Look at this. Uh, they're useless. Huh? They're manufactured. Mm. Made by hands. And let me tell you something. I've never seen an idol made by hands that can do anything for you. Now, there may be hope. Because we may be able to make them into robots. You know, robots that might be able to throw somebody out of church to sleep or something. I don't know. But right now, we have no idol that's made by men that can do anything for men. If you think there is, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to insult you, but think it over. You do. I've never seen any of you riding on an idol. But I've seen a lot of people carrying idols. He says they're dead. They find these human hands. This is Solomon talking. Uh, look what happens. The carpenter made, saw out a suitable tree and skilled to scrape off all his bark, and deftly plying his art, produced something fit for daily use. He makes a table with cherry. And uses up the refuse for his handiwork in preparing his food and have his fill. So things are nice. He scrapes off the thing. You're a carpenter, you always got something to burn, right? Okay. And then, then the good for nothing refuse. In other words, the part that is not good to make a chair. The part that cannot be made into a table. The part that cannot become a part of your bed or a tool. That part, uh, the part that is good for nothing, that crooked wood growing full of knots, he takes and carves to occupy his spare time. So you can see the carpenter. He's made something today, he's feeling pretty good. He was hungry, so he cooked his rice, and he's got his yampalaya, and he's got his, his beef, and uh, you know, maybe he's a, you know, could be, you know. He's got the knock bit. He fixes something real good for dinner. And he's sitting there and he's feeling real good and he has nothing to do. And he's got this old piece of wood here. It's not good for anything. And he just starts going, oh, that looks like an eye. I'll make another eye here. I'll make a head. Look, well, it's not too straight, but I'll straighten it up a little bit. And I'll make it. I'll put an arm here. Make it look here. And I'll put legs and I'll put feet. Wow. And I'll make a belt around it. And it's, kind of, it's naughty, you know, but I'll paint it red. Won't it be pretty? And I get my wife's mascara. Huh? Right? And I put lipstick on it. Well, you saw the Buddhas. Right? And so what does he do? The wood, this wood he models with listless skill. He's got time. And patterns it on the image of a man. Or makes it resemble some worthless beast. Crocodile. When he had daubed it with red and crimsoned its surface with red stains and daubed over every blemish in it, he makes it look smooth. Wow. He makes a fitting shrine for it and puts it on the wall, fastening it with the nail. Thus lest it fall down, he provides for it, knowing that it cannot help itself, for truly it is an image and needs to help. Now, do any of us believe this kind of thing? 
One of our early missionaries in the Philippines didn't understand people's culture here. And you know what he did when he went to the house? When he stayed in this house, he turned the images with their face to the wall. And everybody in the barangay said, that fellow doesn't understand anything. He's very, a very irreverent because he put our idol's face to the wall. What do you think? Can this idol do anything? If there is an earthquake, will it be the first one out the door? But if it's the most powerful and the smartest, it will not be first. It shouldn't even know that it shouldn't even know the earthquake's coming, correct? Yes. But it's on its face when you come back in. Huh? Because it and he's making sure that it don't fall down so he nails it to the wall. Very smart fellow, because you don't want your God to jump off the wall. But when he prays, uh, now but wait, now, now he's done this, okay? This is all done, right? But when he prays about his goods, our marriage, our children. He is not ashamed to address the thing without a soul. Please help my son and his wife to have children. This, um, this God sits there. What does he say? Nothing. You just think about it. Do we believe in that kind of thing? When I went to Palawan, I went to this lady's house, and she's a businesswoman. I don't know what her religion is. I don't even know if she's Filipino, uh, Chinese, maybe Mestiza. But I went into her house, and I smell incense. Because near the one part room, there at the end of the room, there's a pot. And there's sand in it, and there's incense burning. And it's nice because Jesus is there. Jesus statue's there, and Maria statue's there, and Jose statue's there, and the pig with the dollar signs is there. <clears throat> huh? And the Japanese cat who's got his arm on backwards. If you're going to make profit, you say this, not this. I think those guys are saying, stay out of my store, stay out of my store, stay out of my store, stay out of my store. That's, not, that's what I see. But I'm a foreigner, but I don't understand. You buy this little thing, but say, go away, go away, go away, go away, go away, go away. You should be saying, come in, come in, come in, come in. But, but she had all of this stuff. Why? Well, maybe she'll be lucky. You get that? Maybe I'll be lucky. Well, why do you have all of it? You've got Confucius there, and you've got the fat Buddha. With all the children over it, you know. When you want babies, you get a fat Buddha with all the children over it, right? You go to Mexico, you buy a little image down there that will make you have children. You believe that? She did because her house is full of it. But the truth is, they can't even the move. They can't do anything. But we say there must be some power behind it. What power behind it? When the God of heaven told you not to have it, don't expect His power to be behind it. Am I wrong? If I'm stupid, you tell me. But I don't know. And all right. And for vigor, he invokes the powerless. You guys go into the gym. Do you worship? You ought to not. You ought to get out of the Christian statues and get you Hercules, right? Yeah. Or Atlas. Okay. For vigor, he invokes the powerless. And for life, he entreats the dead. You ask a dead thing to give you life. And for aid, he beseeches the holy incompetent. Please help me. I'll tell you something. When that thing was being carved, it didn't walk and help him carry it. He had to carry it all the way himself, correct? It doesn't pick up the little end even of the law. All right. All right. And for profit and business and success with hands, he asked facility of a thing without, with hands completely in earth. I'm sorry, the hands cannot move. The only way the hands on an idol can move is if a man made them with a hinge. Right? With a hinge. Right? Yeah. And we say, well, we don't worship those kind of things. Oh, don't we? Oh, don't we? We'll travel three provinces to get when there's supposed to be an idol to cry one day. All right. Again, one preparing for a voyage and about to traverse the wild ways cries out to wood more than unsound than the boat that bears him. You got the wood nailed to your tree and say, keep me safe on the boat. Huh? For the urge for prophets to devise this ladder, and wisdom the artifacts produce it. The boat was made by guys who wanted to go someplace and buy something or earn something, huh? and they, they were smart enough to make it. But the thing this man is praying that will help him get to the trip with can't do anything. Solomon says, but your providence, oh Father, now look, God's power can help. See, he switched them. But your providence, O oh Father, guides it. 
For you have furnished evil to see a road, and through the way a steady path, showing that you can save from any danger, so that even one without skill may embark. But you will, and that the products of your wisdom be not idle. Therefore men trust their lives even to freighter's wood, and have been safe crossing the surge on a raft. It is wonderful when you go back and read what was happening in the, in the 19th century and early years. How did people travel to the Philippines? When Magellan came, how did he get here? He had to know the winds, right? And the Spanish learned that if you don't leave by a certain date, you cannot go to the Philippines this year. From Acapulco, Mexico, you have to make that trade just right. Because there are roads in the sea, and there are winds, and God has prepared all this. It's all there. All right, you'll see for me yet? For, for of old, when the proud giants were being destroyed, the whole of the universe, who took refuge on a raft, left the world a future for his race under the guidance of, his, of your hand. Now, what he's talking about here is that our God was so great that what did he do? Not like that I was talking about. He prepared. Good, come in, brother. He, he made an ark preserve life. And it's kind of interesting because Solomon said, maybe the giants weren't tall enough to get out of the water. But he says, oh, when the proud giants were being destroyed, the world was caught by water. Value the two kinds of wood. This is a kind of peculiar thing in his day. <clears throat> For blessed is the wood through which justice comes about. But the handmade idol is a curse, and its maker as well. He for having produced it, and it, because though corruptible, it was turned to God. Why would God ask Jeroboam to destroy the idol? Now you can say, is the idol, has the idol done anything? Is the idol innocent? Of course it's innocent. It's done nothing. It's done nothing. But neither had the fig tree, neither had the fig tree Jesus destroyed. Right? It had not borne any fruit, so he used it to show an example to me and you if we don't bear fruit. Huh? Wow. Ah. Maybe the idols getting burned up might make us think about something. Equally odious, bad spelling to God, are the evildoers and his evil deeds. And the things made shall be punished with this contriver. They'll both go down together. How did, how did uh, the strong man, Samson, die? Where did Samson die, my Bible students? What place did he die? Where was he? Uh, come on. That's just in Judges. That's the bad boy in Judges. He died by asking the person to put his hands on the two pillars that held up the temple to the idol of the people he was against, and he killed more Philistines in his death than his life, but the idol perished with them. Wow. Ah. Uh, all right. So, and the things made shall be punished with the contriver. Therefore, oops, back, back. Therefore, even upon the idols of the nation shall a visitation come, since they have become abominable amid God's works snares for the souls of men and a trap for the feet of the senseless. When you and I begin to believe that idol worship is an innocent thing, I want you to start discovering what people do as they worship idols, and especially in your Bible, in the Old Testament. Can you imagine your first baby? You have your first baby. What do you feel like? Is it a boy? Is it a girl? You know what? Chinese have made, they, they killed so many of their baby girls. They don't have any husbands or wives or their husbands over there. But what do you do with your first baby? Oh, and you see your first baby. And the wife says to you, Well, it's very precious, it's very beautiful. And yes, we will go offer it to the god Moloch. Uh, and they'll build a big fire in the idol. And you'll take your first child your most precious child, and you will offer to a God that does not exist in a terrible ritual, and you'll burn that child and show that you're more brutish than any animal. <coughs> they did that, did they not? This is a terrible thing we're talking about. All right. So God's going to punish them, and he did. 
For the source of wantonness is the devising of idols, and their invention was a corruption of life. For in the beginning they were not, nor shall they continue forever. For by the vanity of men they came into the world, the vanity of men they came into the world, and therefore a sudden end is devised for them. What do you, if I ask you to teach me the book of Corinthians, what would be the thing you told me about Corinth? You who have taken the story of class. What is Corinth famous for? Idols. What idol? Who do they love? They love Aphrodite. And what kind of what kind of life will you have in a place dedicated to Aphrodite? The city of prostitution. That was what we have. See? So he's correct, isn't he? All right. For a father, now look, look. How do the how did idols ever come into existence? Well, he says a father afflicted with untimely mourning made an image of his child so quickly taken from him. And now, honored as a god, what was formerly a dead man, and handed down to his subject mysteries and sacrifices. When you go into the cemeteries in my place, in America, we're getting very good at making tombstones. We can put a very good picture of you on your tombstone. And if you lose your child, you're going to put the pretty little picture of your child. And you go there, it's going to break your heart. It's going to close. But what happened with these people? What did this man do? Huh? What did this man do? He made, he mourned his child, he made an image of child, and if he was a king, uh, everybody wants to make the king feel good, so they talk about the king's son. And before the long, this king's son is so good that he's not just good, but he's also become a deity. Huh? And now because everybody begins to worship him. He says, this is how they came about. And they have worship sacrifices and mysteries to it. Then, in time, the impious practice gained strength and strength and was observed by law and great good things were worshipped by princely decrees. In the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, nobody that was educated believed in the gods of the Romans or of the Greeks. But they did deify the emperor. And your early brothers and sisters, if they wanted to live in Bithy, Cappadocia and Pontus, and they were a Christian, would be asked by Pliny the Younger, are you a Christian? If they say, I am not a Christian, you can go home. You can keep your house. You can keep your life. Huh? If you say, I am a Christian, ah, he said, well, I'll tell you again, I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you a Christian? And if you say again, he said, all right, go kill them. But if you say no, he said, well, we know that a Christian will never deny that they're a Christian. Now, if you say, I'm not a Christian, say, that's good. Just take this just take this incense and go burn it and have a prayer in front of the emperor's image. And you can go free. That's all it costs you. Just do that. That's the thing. They didn't believe it. They made the emperor's divine. They talked about it. When they got far away, Ah, when they got far away, they begin to think, well, we'll honor him and make him think of us. Men who lived far away that they couldn't honor him in his presence copied the appearance of the distant king and made a public image him. They, we, they, they wished to honor out of zeal to flatter him when absent as though present. Why would you want to flatter the king? Because maybe he'll give you freedom from taxes. It's all tied up with this world. It's all tied up with this world. Then what else happens? Well, you know, why did you buy, you went to, you went to Bangkok, yes. You went there in the market, yes. Why did you buy the Buddha? Well, it was so pretty. Well, do you believe in Buddha? No. Why did you buy one of their angels? Do you believe in those angels? No, but it was so pretty. In America, you look at somebody's yard, and there is St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> Are you Roman Catholic? No. Why did you buy it? Because he liked animals. And I like animals. So I put him there. Well, what do you believe? I think he's pretty. Why you got I thought you believed in it. When I saw it, I thought you believed in it. Because you had the idol. I thought you believed it. Because that's usually what an image says you believe it. Look what he says. And to remote this observance among those whom it was strange, 
See, you're going to make other people convinced they ought to worship the king. The artist, the artisan's ambition provided a stimulus. Ah, I will be the one who paints the best image of the king. Right? I'll make it pretty than he is. And they did. For he may have in his determination to please the ruler, labor over the likeness of the best to the best of his skill. How? And the masses, that's us, drawn by the charm of the workmanship, soon thought he should be worshipped, who shortly before was honored as a man. What happened? A very, very... Y'all want to know, y'all like movies? And you got a movie idol? You have a movie? Could you become a Philippine idol? Mary an idol? Oh, she's a British idol? Look at our language. Idol, idol, idol. Oh, we don't really mean that. But I just love them. If they go by, we got to run and see their car. Right? And if she changes and starts wearing nothing here, we start wearing nothing here. Correct? <laughs> if she starts wearing a fake goatee, you would start wearing a fake goatee. That's what, am I right? And that's what they did with the king. Ah, oh, we want to all look like the king. And, they, and does this happen in our world? Yes. yes. Now the question is, is it important to talk about? Does it take you away from God? Yes. I'll tell you something. Dancing's all right, I guess. But I hope none of you are so successful that I look on television some night and see you going through all kinds of exercises <laughs> there with very little clothes on in of thousands of people. <laughs> So that you wipe me in a race. Huh? Right? Like Pacquiao. Yeah. Now let's not talk about Pacquiao. We need more. The image becomes a trap. And this became a snare for mankind that men enslaved to either grief or tyranny conferred the incommutable name on stocks and stones. They began to say, This is my God. And they had such. The Romans said, no, we don't worship, but you see there's a spirit in our family, and we have these idols in front of our fireplace because they have to do with the spirits of God. How many of you like Maya, 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 the, the little Chinese girl that becomes Maya? I said, did you like it? Did you like it? Is there any superstition in that movie? How many of you ever had a ride your horse with a dragon sitting behind you? Right? <laughs> huh? How about it? Is there any superstition in that movie? Yes. All of it. Yes. It ends up with the ancestor spirits bouncing around dancing. I'm sorry. All right. They gave up God and they gave up good when they went to idols. Then it was not enough for them to spur in their knowledge of God. But even though they have lived in a great war of ignorance, they call such evils peace. For while they celebrate either child slaying sacrifices, or clandestine mysteries, or frenzied caros carousals, carousing, carousals, in unheard of trites, they no longer safeguard either lives or pure wedlock, but eats either waylays and kills his neighbor or aggravates him by adultery. <laughs> You look what happened to these people. They have no morality left. And he said this was led to them because they have no God left. If there is a man who is an atheist, I will make a deal with him. If, we want to, if he's going to sell me something for 5,000 pesos, all I want him to do is deposit 10,000 pesos with me. Then I know he will do it. Because if a man does not fear God, you cannot trust him. Because he fears nothing for the future. Now look what Paul wrote. This is the same thing. That's why I don't mind using this. Wherefore God gave them up to the desires of their heart. Unto what? Unto a cleanness. To dishonor their own bodies among themselves. Who changed the truth of God unto a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You read that Romans chapter 1. You read it carefully. It's very important. The terrible effects of adultery. So he says, what's happened? All well, this confusion. Blood and murder, theft and guile, corruption, faithlessness, turmoil, perjury. If you want to see this, read uh, The Twelve Caesar by Suetonius. And you see how wicked the Romans were. 
disturbance of good men, neglect of gratitude, dispersing of souls, unnatural lust, disorder in marriage, adultery and shamelessness. Shamelessness. For the worship of infamous idols is the reason and source and extremity of all evil. If you change, if you make something of this world your standard, you will definitely be worldly. Am I wrong? Am I shouting at you? What do you think? Is that correct or not? How far, how, how far can a river go? No higher than the source. Right. Right. Paul spoke, for this cause, because they gave up God, God delivered them to shameful affections. And we, for their women have changed the natural use of the natural use which is against nature. And in like manner the men also, leaving the natural use of women, have burned their lust one towards another. Men with men, working that which is filthy, and receiving in themselves the recompense which was due to their error. I am 77 years old. 70 years ago, my father and his friends who first drank would never have talked about this situation. In our community, in our world of 70 years ago, such things were so shameful, we never, ever mentioned it. What a changed world. Lost <coughs> their moral compass. For they either go mad with enjoyment, or promise our lives, or live lawlessly, or lightly forswear themselves. For their trust is in soulless idols. They expect no harm when they have sworn falsely. Do you believe this book was written by Solomon? I don't believe it was. But I believe he's pictured in this book. This is him. In his old age when he married all those women he was not supposed to be marrying and built temples for them and worshiped with them and did terrible, horrible deeds. But on both counts shall justice overtake them. Two accounts. Because they thought ill of God and devoured, devoted themselves to idols. And because they deliberately swore false oaths, despising piety. That means I will listen to God, I will respect God, and I won't lie to you. For not the might of those that are sworn by, but the retribution of sinners even follows upon the transgressions of the wicked. God is going to take notice. But you, contrast with one true God, but you, our God, are good and true. Slow to anger and governing all with mercy. For even if we sin, we are yours. And know your might, but we will not sin, knowing that we belong to you. For to know you well is complete justice, and to know your might is the root of immortality. The thing that Jesus came to do, and to allow us to do, is that we might know God. You cannot know God without knowing who Jesus Christ is. Uh, no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, who when Brother John wrote that letter, who is in the bosom of Father, He has declared Him. What is God like? He's not an angry, fierce old man wanting to destroy you, but He's someone who loves you and wants to bless you. You don't learn this from an idol, you learn this from Jesus Christ. The godly are not deceived, for neither did the evil creation of men fancy deceive us, but the fruitless labors of painters, a farm speared with various colors, the sight of which aroused yearnings in the senses men to the long to the inanimate form of a dead image. Lovers of evil things, unworthy of such hopes, are they who make them and long for them and worship them. Can you and I be led astray by this? You know what? In my country, a very popular city, New Orleans, New Orleans. Why is New Orleans popular in my state, state, country? Huh? New Orleans, yeah, but there's some. What happens in New Orleans every year? Mardi Gras. Blues. Mardi Gras. And what do we do at Mardi Gras? We do anything we want to. But we're supposed to be religious people. Not at Mardi Gras. At Mardi Gras, we don't have any morality. I'm not expecting to have any around here. Could we be deceived? But you understand something. The music is great, y'all. The singing is wonderful. The colors, the brightness, the excitement. That's what happens. The parades. Wow, we all want to be in a parade, don't we? What are you going to be this year? What am I going to be this year? 
What will we dress like? What will your school be like? What will my school be like? Did we ever be drawn to this? Of course we can. Now he talks about people who do these things. The potter, the man who makes things. For truly the potter laboriously worked the soft earth, most of our service and each several articles, both the vessels that serve for clean purposes and their opposite, all alike, as to what shall be the use of each vessel, neither class, the worker in clay is the judge. So Brother Paul used this, he tells Timothy, some of us was pots for good things, pots for bad things. And the potter decides. But now the potter's going to decide to make something that's not for good, but for bad. Purpose is existence. And with this spent toil, he molds a meaningless God from the self-same clay, though he himself shortly before was made from the earth. He makes something out of dirt, and he himself is dirt. And after a little, is go to go where he has taken, from which he was taken, when the life that was lent him was demanded back. You who have studied uh, Bible geography here in the Bible Study Center, or archaeology, what do the goddesses look like that you saw pictures of? They're not well made. They're really ugly. And somebody made them. Right. But he, his concern is not. Now look, his concern is not that he's going back to the dirt. His concern is not that he is he is to die, nor that his span of life is brief. Rather, he vies with goldsmiths and silversmiths and emulates molders of bronze and takes pride in modeling counterfeits. You overlay a clay thing and make it look like bronze. And you cheat the people, okay? okay. Ashes is his heart. More worthless than earth is his hope. And more ignoble than clay is his life. Because he knew not the one who fashioned him, and breathed into him a quickening soul and infused the vital spirit. Instead he esteemed our life a plaything, and our span of life a holiday for gain. Get that? Our life a holiday for gain. For one must, as he, make profit every way, be it, be it even out of evil. For this man, more than any who knows that he is sinning, when out of earth and stuff, he creates fragile vessels and idols alike. He says he's a great sinner. He does that to lead other people astray. But all are quite sinless, and worse than childish and lying, are the enemies of your people who enslaved them. For they esteemed all the idols of the nation's gods, which had no use of the eyes or vision, nor nostrils to sniff the air, nor ears to hear, nor fingers on their hands, for feeling, even their feet are useless to walk through. He's referring back now to the things of Egypt. What were the gods of Egypt like? Well, you're very lucky if you live in Egypt because you have a goddess for the pregnant, a god for the pregnant babies. I think it looks like a hippopotami. Now you have all kinds of gods, but what did Moses do when he went down there? He destroyed them. For a man made them, one whose spirit has been led and fashioned them. For no man succeeded in fashioning a god like himself. They can't even make it look like themselves. Being mortal, he makes a dead thing with his lawless hands. For he is better than the thing he worships. He at least lives, but never they. You ever think about that? If we have to bow down to an idol, you're alive, but it's not. You ever think about that? <coughs> All right. And besides, they worship the most loathsome beasts for comparables of folly. These are worse than the rest. Nor are their bodies their good or desirable peace, but they have escaped both the approval of God and blessing. When I was over there the other day, I saw one animal, a, an elephant with three heads and one body. Then I saw an animal with two bodies and one head. I couldn't figure it out. All right, can we petition the dead now? Ah, this is where we're supposed to stop at. Those people which made images have already died. All right. Does God permit us to seek help from the dead? Can they help us? We didn't discuss that. Hey, let us think for a minute. If I say to you, San Raytheon, help me. Or maybe I better not use that. Let's see. Who would I say? Um, who would I say? Shiva, help me. What happens? Can they help us? Grandpa. Help me! Great Grandpa, help me! Where's Great Grandpa? Alright. Alright, now I think we need to tell Brother Barry that his little thing did not come up. We're going to close here and stop for. It is time, isn't it, for a break? Yes. It's supposed to get warmer and cooler in here tonight because we closed the door.
It's time, sir. I don't know why we didn't blame him. Leave us get it.